This morning's text is taken from the book of Acts, a sequel to the Gospel of Luke, which concludes with the post-resurrection Christ ascending into heaven and promising the gift of the Holy Spirit. Apostles have indeed received that gift, complete with heavenly special effects, like the sound of a mighty rushing wind, flames of fire hovering in the air, and the ability to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ in languages heretofore unknown to them. Peter preaches a sermon to the crowds in Jerusalem, resulting in an altar call that every preacher fantasizes about. 3,000 people were added to those who came to be known as followers of the way. And so this morning we are given a snapshot of that early Christian community. For some people, our text evokes feelings of longing for the good old days, simpler days of prayer and table fellowship and Bible study, no fancy sanctuaries, no PowerPoint presentations, no printed orders of worship, just a humble community of people who gathered together lifted each other up and supported each other's spiritual and physical needs. For others, it evokes no such feelings of nostalgia for days gone by, but instead a sense of relief that no one today expects them to sell off all their hard-earned possessions and belongings for the welfare of others, some of whom they suspect to be freeloaders. And for still others, the text creates a sense of unease. Have we lost our way? They ask themselves. As much as we enjoy potluck socials, the idea of these sorts of gatherings several times a week seems a bit much. And if this is a picture of early Christianity, then can we really call ourselves Christians if we are unwilling to sell everything we have for the greater good of the community. Well, it may help to know that there is debate among Bible scholars as to whether this morning's text was idealized or not, but maybe that's not so important. Maybe what's important is that centuries ago, our spiritual ancestors did the same things that we do. They studied the written word. They prayed. They lifted each other up, offering words of encouragement. They cared for the needs of those within their fellowship. They participated in the ancient Christian ritual of Holy Communion. And yes, they had potluck socials. What may be missing at times today, though, is what our text calls the glad and generous hearts that accompanied their good deeds. It was this sense of joy that became their trademark even among people outside of their faith. There's no indication in this passage that their giving was out of a sense of obligation, but rather it seemed to be some kind of spontaneous and contagious kindness. I will admit that I don't always have that sense of joy in the work I do for the church. When I walk into the church office and see the number six blinking on the phone's message machine, I usually don't see it as six unique opportunities to reflect God's love to someone. Instead, I see the plans I'd made for the day going out the window. When I purchase groceries for our HIV food pantry, instead of thinking of the people who are always so very grateful for the food items, I often reduce the grocery run to the status of one of many tasks I'm obliged to complete by the day's end. And I'll admit that when a stranger walks into the church during the week, asking for some gas money to get them to Austin or Dallas, more times than not, I don't sit them down so they can tell me their story. Instead, I do whatever needs to happen to send them on their way so that I can get back to my office work. It's the joy that's missing. 
It's the sense of awe that our text says came upon everyone because of the many wonders and signs that were being done. It's the astonishment at the new thing that God is doing with me when I give myself over to the Holy Spirit. That's what needs to somehow be recaptured. That joy, that awe, that new thing that God is doing in me and through me. I suspect I'm not the only person here with those sorts of feelings. Maybe your sense of spirituality has been reduced to an hour out of each week in which, in which you show up on Sunday mornings, find your spot in the pew that you always sit in, sing a few songs, listen to a brief sermon that you may or may not find very inspiring, and make your way back to your home unchanged, untouched, and unmotivated to do more than you are already doing. If you place money in the basket, you may not consider the impact it makes in the life of the church and the lives of other people. If you may decide to take a break from church every once in a while, you don't think about how your absence leaves a hole in the body of Christ that can only be filled by you. You occasionally wonder what's God, God's purpose for you, but you don't give it too much thought because when you do, all you can imagine is the sacrifice it may incur instead of the joy it could bring to your life. <coughs> Maybe you too need to recapture the sense of joy that's conveyed in this morning's text. Maybe you need to be a part of that new thing that God wants to do with this church. After worship, we will be offering a ministry fair in the social hall. Representatives from different ministries will be available to share information about how you can join with their efforts in making an impact on lives within our church and our community. It's the perfect place to connect with other people who are committed to reflecting God's love out to the world. You may even have some ideas of your own about a new ministry at our church. You may not be ready for taking on the extreme discipleship mentioned in today's text where people sold all their property and possessions for the greater good of the faith community. I don't think I am. But I'll bet you are ready for the glad heart that comes with generosity. And if you are, I encourage you to stick around after worship. Check out the information tables and then enjoy a hot dog lunch with others like yourself. Giving your time, your talents, and a portion of your financial resources should be a joy, not drudgery. Unfortunately for many of us, it turns into an obligation because we've lost sight of why we give. We should be giving because we have been blessed by God. And God is depending on us to pay it forward. That's how the kingdom of God works. It starts out small and then spreads exponentially, touching one life after another. Generosity should be a joyful undertaking. If you feel like you could stand a bit more joy in your life, then try giving generously of yourself. Even more than transforming the world, it will transform your own life into one with a sense of purpose. Amen. <clears throat>